I mean, it's shocking, it's demoralizing, it's sad, it's tragic, it's all those things. The Dan York State of Mind program is brought to you in part by Lookout Rhode Island and Taco Comfort Solutions. You know, we're paid to use words. I have no words uh, to, uh, to, to offer in, in, in this conversation, but, you know, we have to talk about it. And what's smart is to bring some smart people who understand a little bit of what we're dealing with. Good evening. Uh, nice to have you into my state of mind. I think everybody's state of mind today was just a total funk. Uh, the weekend's been a funk. You carry on with what you're doing, and, and you, you feel weird about it, and, and, and you feel just horror for what happened in Orlando, and, and you don't understand, and, you know, where's the world coming to? And then we get into conversations about what ought to be done, and it's just all part of our process, and hopefully we don't have to repeat it again, but likely we will. Uh, headlines, we're going to skip the rundown today. We've got too much going on. We originally scheduled Lieutenant Governor Dan McKee to talk, to talk about charter schools, and that's what we're going to do by the end of the show. But uh, let's look, take a look at uh, some of the recent headlines uh, yesterday, today. Uh, police detail uh, the battle to end this massacre. Uh, reportedly, he was very calm during the whole thing. Jeez, I'm so happy for him. Islamic State shows it can still inspire violence as it emphasizes attacks abroad. That'll be part of our conversation here with our excellent guest. Uh, Orlando nightclub attack was the deadliest. I think you know that, but reinforcing it seems like something we do. And uh, yeah, the FBI is trying to figure out how to explain to everybody. And earlier today, uh, Director Comey, you know, uh, you know, explained the play-by-play -play of you know what they knew and uh, about this guy and you know what the laws allow them to do and you know who's on what list and who's not and all of that. Um, I'm sure you've seen lots of news stories and packages, but in case you missed the details, I guess we're forced to, to give them some of the give you some of the details right now. FBI agents searched for evidence Monday morning outside the Pulse nightclub. Police say the last of the victims have been removed. Authorities are now working to notify all the next of kin. Gunfire erupted in the crowded gay club just after last call Sunday morning. Police say an officer working at the club exchanged fire with 29-year-old Omar Mateen. Additional officers entered the club sparking another gun battle. The attacker then retreated to a bathroom with a number of hostages. Police say that's when Mateen called 911, pledging his allegiance to ISIS and claimed to have a bomb. Around 5 a.m., a SWAT team punched several holes through a wall and stormed the club. We believe uh, future loss of life was imminent, and that's why we reacted the way we did. Mateen, born in New York to Afghan parents, was a security guard with no criminal record. His father says the attack goes against everything he taught his son. I don't approve what he did. What he did was completely an uh, act of terrorist. The FBI had investigated him twice about possible terror ties, but cleared him. Authorities say they are following up on 100 leads. Many club goers managed to escape, but dozens remain trapped. Mina Justice's son, Eddie, hid in a women's bathroom with several others while he texted his mother. Trapped in the bathroom downtown. Please call police. I'm going to die. Eddie was confirmed dead this morning. More than 50 others were injured, many of them in critical condition. In response to the tragedy, hundreds of people lined up to donate blood. Uh, Timothy Edgar is a senior fellow in international and public affairs at, uh, at Brown at the uh, Watson Institute. It's right in his wheelhouse, this whole internet cyber thing. He's been a, a, a friend of the show, and we thank you for coming back in. Sure, absolutely. Um, he is ISIS, he is an ISIS, he doesn't have any direct ties we so, learned today, but you know, he's reading everything, he's been, he's been radicalized, but only through the, what? So really this is an example of one of the threats that we've been most worried about since September 11th, and we're seeing it more and more since the Boston Marathon bombing, and that's self-radicalized people. Uh, in a way, some people have talked about ISIS as crowdsourcing terrorism. Uh, they put out their hateful propaganda, uh, and they ask people to go kill people in, uh, in the West. And uh, unfortunately, there are some people that are crazy enough to go and do it. And what's really most disturbing about this kind of terrorism is that it seems very difficult to stop. If you don't have connections or plots between a group like Al-Qaeda or some of these traditional terrorist groups and, and terrorist operatives, there's nothing to, to monitor and then interdict. Um, at least as far as we know, Omar Mateen was acting on his own, based on his own uh, hate, essentially. Generated from this propaganda. That's true. And, and, and whatever life experience. Correct. And 
You know, I, I think the most important thing, you said there are no words, and there aren't, but this was a, an attack on, on us, on our society, uh, on our ability to go about our ordinary daily lives. This was a, a gay nightclub in Orlando, and this person uh, had such hatred for that group uh, that he decided to take it into his hands. He, he calls it ISIS or, you know, Islamic terrorist ideology. Uh, if it were another type of person with a different background, there would have been another ideology. Um, but it's it's a form of hatred that uh, allows people to to feel like they're not alone do when we get, they're on these, these kinds of forums. Do we get bogged down? And, and don't, listen, believe me, there's no disrespect intended in, in this question, but do we get bogged down on identifying groups and victims? Well, you said the best at the top. This is an attack on all of us. Correct. The, the gay uh, community, the LGBT community, feels ex especially victimized here, understandably, because of the nature of the club. It can't be ignored. The gay pride parades that, that's going to happen here in Rhode Island coming up uh, later in the week, it now has special law enforcement attention to it, um, more so than was already scheduled. We'll talk about it in the next segment. But I don't want us to get bogged down in classification of victim. It's an attack on America. Right. Uh, absolutely. And you see these other kinds of attacks. Um, and whatever the nature of the group that's being targeted, you look at the Charleston church uh, uh, shooting, you know, that was attacking a black church. So, you know, there's no particular group that's out there that couldn't be the victim of a terrorist attack. Um, you know, but the Charleston the, thing was not necessarily ISIS oriented. No, no, absolutely, very much the opposite. My that's where the connection is. You know, yeah. ISIS, uh, you know, propaganda, anti, you know, right. uh, clearly homophobic. Right. And, and so there is that connection. That's why this guy is able to make that connection. That's why ISIS is able to take some credit for all of this, right? Right. And my point, I guess, is just that uh, there's a type of hateful. Uh, person who's looking for an excuse to go out and commit these kinds of horrible acts of murder um, and it's going to depend on their life experience and background which ideology which hateful ideology they may attach themselves to. You've been studying internet freedom, yeah. the privacy issues what 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 are we doing in, in terms of understanding the asset and liability that the internet provides us here? Sure. Well it puts the FBI in a very difficult position uh, they can't uh, arrest somebody simply for having distasteful or hor horrible ideology or thoughts. Uh, they can look into somebody like uh, Omar Mateen, and they did, um, and they have to find some reason, some uh, uh, crime that that person has committed. And unfortunately, there are all sorts of places on the Internet uh, in which people can exchange these kinds of hateful views. And the vast majority, even of those people that exchange those kinds of hateful views, will not act on them. So the FBI is, is constantly dealing with these sorts of things day in and day out. They're looking at people like Omar Mateen. And if, if, uh, if there's nothing to charge them with or to do, they really have very little choice but to close their investigation. Are, are, is the FBI and every other law enforcement agency uh, and, and, and I ask this not with a criticism, yeah. uh, just a critical question. Are they behind the technology? Is the technology well unwieldy in terms of what they're able to do? I, I Should think there be some manipulation of the technology? That's really what you study. Uh, what you sure. Experience. Look, I think that the FBI and there's also the intelligence community. Um, DHS has an intelligence agency. Uh, the CIA does foreign um, open source intelligence in terms of radical sites on the Internet. Uh, the, these efforts have to be really thoroughly integrated. Uh, there are some efforts certainly today, but yes, I think that we are behind the times in the sense that our, our government is set up you know, along certain agency lines, and even with the best of intentions and the best of the kind of information sharing we've been doing, it's difficult to keep ahead of this kind of threat especially when you have ISIS and these kinds of groups uh, really adapting in a way that allows them to uh, achieve this kind of maximum impact. I mean, a, a, a nightclub in Florida, this is not the kind of thing you would expect to surround with armed guards. Right. Do we get them at, so, so, all right, so there's going to be some conversation about getting ISIS where they live and, and, and ramping, up, ramping up attacks in the Middle East because one guy decided to take it on his own. <laughs> 
it doesn't, yeah. It, it, you know, it, but it, it's an old style of thinking. I mean, you know, we could go attack ISIS in their uh, headquarters in the Middle East, uh, but that's not going to stop them from continuing to radicalize people in the United States, in Europe, in Australia, or wherever they're able to do that. I'm not saying we shouldn't do that. I'm just saying that we shouldn't assume that that's going to be the answer to this. We also should look at watch lists, and we should look at access to guns. Um, this person was on a watch list, and yet even being on a watch list did absolutely yeah. nothing to prevent him from buying a gun. So the access to guns is, 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 is a conversation we go back to, and I don't think we should be fatigued by it. We'll talk about it. We'll have Lieutenant Governor join us when we come back to it. Before the Lieutenant Governor joins Tim with me here, here's a, a little bit of a, a sidebar in the politics of this awful thing in Orlando. The shooter in Orlando used a high-powered assault rifle to execute his deadly rampage. It's a similar weapon used in attacks carried out in San Bernardino, California, Aurora, Colorado, and in Newtown, Connecticut. Senator Chris Murphy has been a leading advocate for gun control since the Newtown shooting. He issued a statement saying Congress has become complicit in these murders by its total, unconscionable, deafening silence. But some lawmakers say the real problem is terrorism. We need to be taking the fight to them and our enemies need to know that we have the wherewithal in order to do that <clears throat> and it's and we need to be make, focusing on those um, issues here in Congress over the next couple of days rather than trying to politici politicize this activity this event the ongoing debate over gun control on the presidential campaign trail is now on center stage Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton both addressed the issue We've got to keep weapons of war off our streets, uh, like the one used in Orlando, as well as blocking suspected terrorists from buying guns. Trump counters that the suspect in this shooting was licensed and legally allowed to carry the assault weapon. He says the solution is more guns. If you had some guns in that club uh, the night that this took place, if you had guns on the other side, you wouldn't have had the tragedy that you had. Trump once supported a ban on assault weapons prior to his presidential run, but has since changed his mind. Uh, Lieutenant Governor Dan McKee was scheduled to talk about charter schools, and we'll get to that in the last segment. Um, uh, Tim joins us uh, for the second segment as well. Uh, your gut check on this is? Yeah, it's just disheartening. It's, it's, it's sobering, and it's, uh, you know, it's, like you said earlier, it's unexplainable. I'll uh, take a look at some of the, the tweets that the candidates for the presidency, you, you heard about them in the package. Uh, President Obama, he's a disgrace, he ought to resign. Yeah, great, great temperament from the Republican candidate talking for the, uh, asking for the president to resign. Uh, then he thanks, you know, more or less appreciates the congratulations for being right and radical Islamic terrorism. I mean, my God. Uh, Hillary Clinton, uh, you know, has to be dragged kicking and screaming to the issue of radical Islamic terrorism, but of course she empathizes at least with the LGBT community. Uh, and it goes, we've got more, we just uh, lay them out there. Um, uh, keep guns like this out of the hands of terrorists, uh, the violent criminals, and the final, uh, let's get together and, and, and stay together. Uh, the politics of this, Tim, I mean, you've been a Washington player for a long time. Uh, uh, Donald Trump is, is I'd lose yeah. words yeah. over this guy. Yeah. Uh, look, the problem here is obvious. It's the exploitation of a tragedy involving the murder of 50 yeah. people uh, for short-term political gain on a tweet. And I don't see how that's anything other than disgraceful. Um, you know, he, what, we were supposed to have built a wall with Mexico and that was going to stop somebody in Orlando from shooting people? We're, you know, keeping all Muslims out of the country when this guy was born in the country? I mean, there's, there's no way to possibly justify his claiming that he was right about this. Even some of the rhetoric in the story, though, this, this traditional argument of getting them where they are, yeah. uh, blah, 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 blah. I, yeah. I, right. You I know, mean, you I, if just, we can't have a good conversation about gun control, and AK-47s, very conservative Republican types that I know, friends of mine yesterday were voluntarily talking about the need to take the weaponry away, you know, and, and to make the weaponry illegal, inaccessible on a legal purchase, which reportedly this guy was able to do. Uh, this is the problem. He, he could, you could put somebody on a watch list today and they can still go in and buy this kind of gun today. They wouldn't be able to get on an airplane, What's but they take? could buy a gun. Well, 
I do support the Second Amendment, but the Second Amendment was wrote, written in like 1770, 81 or whatever it is. I mean, there was not these Muskets. type of, there, yeah, there weren't you know. these type of things that you would anticipate that could get into hands of people who hate the way that this individual obviously hated not only, uh, you know, Americans, but also the, in this case, the gay community. So he, he, he w it seems to me he, he could have gone anywhere with his, with his automatic weapon, and he chose there. So. People who are on the terror side also can hate people that are, uh, you know, gay or black or whatever it might be. As Lieutenant Governor, you have a, uh, you know, a role in 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 in, in the uh, emergency management aspect yes. of the state. Uh, Tim, during the break, was asking you about some of these uh, newly formed uh, fusion centers, fusion yes. centers, which yeah. the Colonel of the State Police I heard on the radio talking about earlier today. Um, we have one here. We have one, and uh, there's a direct contact to all the local law enforcement as well as a former mayor. I know when something happened like this, uh, whatever it might be, that was a, a large, you know, red alert going around, and, and, and all these pockets of, of law enforcement. And uh, our chief of chi chief of staff, who was our former chief of police in the town of Cumberland, is in contact with emergency management today to kind of get an overview of what. Exactly, you know the, what the short-term and long-term prospects are for Rhode Island. Yeah, the, the the hard thing is, is you know, what are you fusing? You know, it's information that you're trying to piece together. You study this all the time. What's interesting, though, is that this guy was mouthing off in ways that may not have been prosecutable, but were warning signs. And uh, the, the 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 idea here is, is rhetoric matters now, right? Whether it's online or spoken. Sure, and it's a very tough job that the police and the FBI have to draw that line between somebody's distasteful or obnoxious views and acting on them and becoming a violent terrorist. Mm -hmm. And so the fusion centers are supposed to fuse that intelligence information together uh, from the state, local, uh, and, and federal authorities in order to uh, allow people to act. What's your bottom line thought on today? Not that there is one. But there, there isn't really a simple answer, and we are not going to be able to stop every shooting or even horrific shooting, but there are, there are common sense measures we can take to make them less likely. And they uh, are. Reducing access to guns for people on the terrorist watch list seems number one to me. Um, also, uh, doing steps to counter violent extremism in, in our communities. Uh, Department of Homeland Security, uh, state and local police have been doing that kind of thing to spot these sort of people uh, using community <coughs> leaders uh, and try to turn them around to a better path. Okay, thank you. Appreciate it. Sure. When we come back, the intended uh, visits on, on charter schools. See, if you forget about the local stuff that matters because this guy is doing his thing, then they win and they win and they win. We'll be right back. All right. Thanks. Nice saying hello. Again, if you stop paying attention to local issues while something like this happens, um, they, they win, they win, they win, they win. So let's get back to what I intended to talk to Lieutenant Governor about, albeit uh, a short period of time. Headlines, uh, state budget, uh, and on the left you see charter to, to cry, uh, cut in funding. This is last uh, week, and there's the headline there. And of course, simultaneous with that, the governor didn't really know that there were changes in the charter school funding. Uh, Dan McKee was on with me on the radio on Friday talking about this. Uh, we only have a handful of minutes here. This is, uh, this is an assault on, on charter schools by the General Assembly, is it not? It's certainly a targeted um, approach to kind of take away funding from charters uh, in a way that uh, is um, not necessarily well thought out. All right, it's, it, you've been able to do some more homework. Uh, Kev, if you can, not that we're going to be able to follow this completely, but there's legislation uh, proposed here by the House of Representatives that we can show you uh, the, the language mm. of, uh, if we have that, we have that handy. We do, we do, we do, we do. We don't? Yeah. Okay, there it is. Uh, and I'm not going to be able to read all that way through, but Dan points out that this is the actual explanation of what the formula now is for what the reduction of financial payment that a local school district has to make to a charter school uh, based on the on the file of the child formula that's been in there. In other words, the file of the child formula where a kid can go from a district to a charter school, whatever the prorated uh, formula for per pupil fee is, would be sent to the charter school. Now it's been reduced. The governor offered uh, a $355 per student reduction in the burden the local school district would have to send the kid to the charter, and now that General Assembly language really messes things up. How? So there's two ways that that uh, charters can lose um, more uh, local dollars and the local districts would have to send less to the, to the districts. One is with a 7%, an additional 7% reduce from what the current uh, contribution is. And But the thing that's very concerning is that there's language uh, that goes into like um, uh, pension issues, 
long-term health insurance issues that can be piled on in a way that will actually grab more. Kind of an ideological argument by maybe the teacher unions and the like that says, hey, look, the charter doesn't have the expense that we have in our particular pension system, so if you're sending a kid to a charter that doesn't have our particular pension system, there'll be more deductions for the district because that's the penalty. Yes, and then there's additional language on that that targets the mayoral academies because their teachers aren't in the state pension. And the schools, you're, I mean, you're one of the authors yes. of the mayoral academies. And I think anywhere where there's, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, an attack on good schools, it, it, it doesn't help. I mean, in this in this situation, the district of Providence is going to be the district school in Providence is going to lose money. Meaning the, the school district system. school, the yeah, system. the district school in Woonsocket is going to lose money, and district of Cum I mean in Cumberland, which is my hometown, is going to lose money. And I would just say, uh, with the time you got, to just give the audience an idea of what the tar how it's targeted, you're taking uh, mayoral academies and saying because they have a Social Security and a 401k and they're investing money in there, that they deserve to lose money because they're not in the state pension. That's clearly a, uh, an argument that's been, you know, proliferated in the, in the General Assembly through the union, union advocates and also the, uh, you know, the people who want to protect the status quo. The Providence Journal um, came out against this uh, on Friday strongly on an editorial basis. Uh, I know how I think about it. Do you have any momentum to stop this from the lieutenant governor's position? What's the governor saying? Is she going to get active? Because she's been kind of duped here. Well, I think there's, there's discussions going on, and as uh, I've said publicly, well, let's hope that, uh, you know, cooler heads prevail and making sure that we're not uh, shortchanging any, any child that's in a public school. Right now, uh, targeting the mayoral academies on that pension issue alone uh, and, and, and making those young kids suffer and the teachers in those schools suffer because you're not in the state pension, it, is ju it would be just as ridiculous as, as making an argument because the Cumberland school system does not provide a Social Security benefit in retirement that somehow because they save those dollars right in that district that they should be penalized and money should be taken away from those teachers and from that education system. It, it, ca it doesn't cold water yet that's getting some level of traction and that's what that's what is absurd about the whole discussion here. Let's do it on good policy, not not create bad policy to kind of uh, you know disturb the whole. You want thing. people to call their reps and senators? I think they should call the reps and senators, and and I I think that reverting back even the seven percent that the that the general assembly put in, uh, if they get rid of the the convoluted language that could actually uh, manipulate the system, that actually works in a way that works better than uh, than going into okay. attacking any schools, right, any kids in those schools. Thanks for coming in. Yeah, Lieutenant Governor Dan McKee, final word when we come back. You know, we suffer tragedies like this, but you got to go on. The Tony Awards went on last night. There was a speech they made at the top of the show. Uh, we have a headline here, A Bridge Back to Sanity. Uh, the awards gave comfort and joy. By the way, there were Stanley Cup hockey playoffs last, last night. Pittsburgh won the, the Stanley Cup, and there was celebration over that. Well, there should be. But, you know, when we suffer these kinds of, of, of attacks, there's a part of all of our psyche that just says, you know, why am I celebrating? I guess that's what the terror is all about. We'll talk more about it over the course of the week and on the radio at 3 o'clock on WPRL. Good night.